Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I would like to introduce you to Susie Dent. She overcame her psychological fear of frocks at the age of 55 and has transformed her life. She was at the beginning of the Me Too movement and has become an international speaker. She's got a lot going on for her, even just beyond that. So I'm excited to talk to her today. So Susie, thank you so much for being here. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about yourself? Oh, thank you, Sarah. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Well, I'm so I'm Susie Dent. I'm a film and television hair and makeup artist. I have been for oh nearly 38 years now. Um, so I can I do pretty and ugly makeup. So I can make you look like you've gone through the windscreen of a car with your face, or I can make you look like you're going to a ball. Um, I have an awesome career. I've worked with some amazing people over the decades, and and uh, and done thousands of people, um, which has been uh, awesome. Uh, and uh, one of my favourite jobs that I've been doing recently is covering people's tattoos. I'm really good at covering uh, tattoos and turning people into clean skins. And I work for this UK company who fly me, they fly me uh, to New Zealand uh, to do this for this show. And I cover, I work with extremely tattooed people, like head to toe, face, eyeballs, the whole thing. And I get to make them into clean skin so they have like a reveal to their nearest and dearest. Uh, and I love doing that because I take, uh, I take them on a psychological journey as well. Because uh, the thing about makeup, it's um, a lot of it is about psychology uh, because um, makeup changes and enhances uh, what we look like, and um, and when we look in the mirror, that changes who we f- how we feel about ourselves. So um, it's uh, wonderful. One of my other favourite things to do is to make up women and make them look as their most beautiful selves, and watch them look in the mirror, um, and watch their self esteem just rise to huge levels. Oh, it makes me emotional just thinking about it. And it's just the most wonderful thing to see to see women's self esteem rise just because I've used my brushes. And my words, which is just great. So I've I've had an amazing career, and I'm ever so uh, grateful that I still work. I'm doing a shoot uh, in two days, actually, uh, which is great. So I still do uh, work. Uh, the industry has taken a bit of a, a hit in the last two years. The film and television industry hasn't actually quite recovered. Um, so um, you know, a, but a lot of industries have taken a hit. You know, a lot of people have zigzagged or pivoted in their careers and their lives to do different things. Uh, so it just teaches us really to be resilient um, and that we can do lots of things if we put our minds to it. Um, what else do I do? You mentioned that I'm a beauty queen. Well, let me take you on a little journey and I'll tell you my little story. Um, in um, Actually, I'll take you on a whole life journey. In, uh, in 1986, as a film and television makeup, hair and makeup artist, I was working at uh, Channel 7 Studios with one of the biggest stars that have ever walked through the door. Right? Uh, and this man was, uh, his name, uh, he uh, was a, a massive star, massive entertainer. And uh, I spent the whole day with him. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this was 1986, and he groped me on set all day. Couldn't keep his hands off me. He was a dirty old man. Anyway. Uh, so I had an unpleasant day with a dirty old man. I'm telling you guys, it's not to, not to give you something like a, a Debbie Downer or anything. But I'm just setting up this this amazing journey that I've had that takes me to now. Um, And uh, so I had a bad day with a dirty old man, like really not a very good day, Uh, and um, never kept it a secret, told everybody, every man and his dog. People would always ask me, who's the best person? Because I've worked with many stars, right? Who's the most famous? Who's the best person you've worked with and who's the worst? And the best person would always be, you know, whoever I was, you know, in love with at the time that I'd worked with, you know, who'd been wonderful. But the worst person was always him, right? Uh, and he was, he worked with children, this guy. So um, it, it just really wasn't cool. So um, now we come forward a little bit. So I don't want to go into too much detail because, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's another story. But at the moment, so, it, we, so we flash forward. Um, I have a bad, bad day with this guy, right, um, and uh, we get past it and I don't say anything because women never said anything back then. They can't say anything because it would have disturbed the shoot. I could have cost the station millions of dollars. This man was a major megastar, so I just had to let him grope me all day because that's what women had to do back then. Um, in 2013, I'd been working all this time as a hair and makeup artist. I never had to work with that man again, which was great. Um, I saw this uh, program uh, on a current affairs show 
And there was this woman who um, had actually come forward and was taking this man to court uh, for assaulting her, um, sexually assaulting her when she was a little girl on tour with him. Um, and uh, at the time, the press, nobody believed her because this man was majorly loved in England, Europe, Australia. Uh, you know, everybody loved him. He was, you know, the, the lovable person next door. He would never hurt a fly. There's no way, you know, this woman was obviously just coming forward for the money because that's what you put yourself out to society to be crucified for just for the hell of it, you know. Um, and I was watching this program and I thought, um, I know you're not lying because I had this really crap experience and I know that you're not lying. Um, and also at the time she'd, um, she decided to come forward and put her name out there, which is obviously why she, you know, was on the, on the program. And uh, she had this PR agent who literally threw her to the wolves um, as far as the press were concerned and didn't protect her or educate her on how to speak or anything. And she was really having a hard time and you can see it in the interview. And I really felt bad for her and I'm a big, um, I don't like injustice, especially when it's smacking me in the face. I have I've never have. Ever since I was little I just can't handle it. You know, I have to step up. And uh, so after the interview I, um, I, uh, I approached via email, um, I, I emailed some um, cop stations in the UK and Scotland Yard and, you know, a few choice places and uh, with uh, a couple of words and a bit about my story, um, this man was called the Octopus, that was his nickname and that went all around the world and the words that were used all came out of my mouth, you know, which was very interesting because the police, you know, got in touch with me and uh, I became part of this case and it's it's called Operation Yew Tree. It's now famous in England. They they um, listen to victims of historical sexual crimes for the first time in decades. Women, women were finally being listened to and heard um, and action was being taken and they, they caught a lot of major stars over there and jailed them and I um, was became part of this case because I came forward um, and I was called a bad character witness. It was basically what what a bad character witness is. I just came forward to tell what it was like working with him for a day, you know, uh, and uh, I didn't, you know, that was, that was my responsibility. It wasn't my responsibility, you know, to think about what he'd get uh, jailed or anything like that. I just had to, you know, tell my story. Uh, so, um, I wasn't sure whether I was going to be flying over to England or anything like that. It was um, it was a really weird time because it was press all around the world about these men being taken down and this guy, um, his name was Rolf Harris. Uh, he, um, you know, it, it was all over the press here because he's actually Australian and then emigrated to Britain and friend of the Queen and, you know, big, big dude, famous, multi, multi-rich, all that sort of stuff, powerful. So you don't expect, um, you know, when I saw it um, uh, and found out about it, I didn't expect that they would actually get him to jail or anything like that. I just figured um, it will somehow it will just disappear because that seems to be what happens, you know. Um, so I came forward and um, I, um, I was promised um, anonymity and then um, uh, at, at some stage the Consolidated Press in the UK, uh, because it was such a massive story, approached the courts and the judge because they wanted the name of the bad character witnesses. They ended up having witnesses, lots and lots and lots, and people came forward from all over the world, you know. They had um, a part of this case, there were women, yeah, there were women who were assaulted by him when they were little girls and lots of people came forward. Um, so I, um, I had to write a letter to the judge about how I felt, about whether, you know, my name was put out there. And um, pretty much, uh, you know, I wrote this really succinct letter, which I was really happy about, uh, and pretty much said, look, you know, if you, cho- if the judge chooses um, to put my name out there so that I can have mud and crap slung all over me by people wanting to, you know, put me down and make make me into a liar and blah 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 blah, all the crap that people do and the trolling and um, then that was his call. Uh, but if women like me and people like me didn't come forward, then the women who have been brave enough to come forward with, you know, childhood sexual assault are just being assaulted and abused all over again and that's just not good enough. So I'm pretty much like, well, that's your call, mate. You think that's a cool thing to do, you just go for it, but I'm still coming forward. And because of, and because of that letter, um, uh, the judge chose me as one of the witnesses uh, in the case, which is great. And the weirdest thing, being in a court case like this, Sarah, and, and, and listeners, is that um, I'm at home one night, right, 
and I'm watching just, uh, you know, I'm here by myself. It's night time. I'm, I'm just kind of vaguely watching, listening to another news current affairs program. And all of a sudden I hear these words. And I'm like, hang on, I said that. And I look up. And there's a split screen in front of me. There's a male news reader's, reader's head on one side and there's my words in the email to the judge going up the screen on the other. I pissed myself laughing. I thought, oh, my God, A, how on earth did they get my my email to the judge? I said it to the cops, you know, how does this happen? Do, 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 you know, and um, and secondly, I was pissing myself laughing because I thought I was so glad I wrote such a good email. And, and they left the last bit out in the, t- in the TV show, which I said, Rolf Harris is guilty. They left that out. But they, word for word, there's my email on the screen. Right? And I knew there and then that I was now public property, uh, that everything I said or did could be used, seen, written, whatever, do you know? Um, so that was, uh, that was a really surreal experience. And I'm glad I have such a sense of humour. Um, Because I guess some people could really get quite upset by that. I was just, I still don't know how they got it. I was just dumbfounded. I thought, how do you get it? It must get leaked from the cops or something, you know. And I I don't like to say things like that, but how else do they get them if you send that, you know, anyway. We won't, we won't, I won't go into that because we don't, I don't, you know, do anything like that. Anyway, I, I got flown over, right, with my girlfriend as a support person, which was super important. Um, I got flown over to the UK in 2014. I think it was June, July. Um, and uh, to be part of this case, there was only ten of us all together. Um, some people did uh, did it via Zoom from other countries, um, and um, I was told by uh, so I had a really lovely, really really looked after me. The police were amazing. I had they called me uh, when I was here, email support. It was anything I needed. I was supported with. Um, they prayed for my accommodation and all that sort of stuff, which was great. And my flights, um, they were. Um, Really, really great. Um, you know, I've never even done jury duty, so here I am. You know, about to go to court with one of the with like the biggest, uh, you know, a c- case in the world at the time. It's like my friends have said to me, "Susie, you never do anything by halves, do you?" It's like, nah, nah, go big or go home. That's my motto. Uh, so I, um, they smuggled me. So I arrived there, right, and they smuggled me into the courtroom the next day with my girlfriend because there was hordes of press outside. So it was that t- traditional, like you see in the movies, uh, the underground car park up the back, smuggled up the back doors of this huge, you know, big courtroom in London. Um, and um, they popped me into a room with my friend uh, for probably about, I don't know, it seemed like a long time, probably a couple of hours. Um, and uh, I was just listening to music the whole time. Now, this might sound weird, but apparently, and I've researched it afterwards, when we listen to music, it helps... Um, Raise uh, like raise your endorphins and 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 raise kind of the happy hormone in your body. Because you know when you've got something really big to do, um, and you re- if you think about it, you start to let yourself get nervous. You get butterflies in your stomach, and then before you know it, you're either vomiting or you've got diarrhea. You know, so <laughs> um, I really wanted to keep myself really centered, um, and you know, and as still as possible. I didn't reread my testimony or anything like that because you never know what's going to happen in the courtroom, and I knew my story. So the song I listened to over and over and over again was Pharrell Williams' Happy because I'm happy, da, 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 da. not because I was happy that I was there but because it really kept me in this really elevated, calm state. I'm quite a high vibrational person, which you might be able to tell even by listening to me, um, and I'm quite high energy. So high energy songs really, I don't know, keep me, keep me happy. Um, and, uh, so I, I, over and over and over again, I just sat there with the, with my things on and walked around and paced the room. And then at lunchtime, we got taken into the courtroom cause there was no one in there. And, uh, we walked through the door and this really lovely man, um, the court clerk, um, showed us around the microphones everywhere, microphones on the floor, this big kind of perspex cage in the back middle of the room with this trestle table where he would sit cause you know, he's in jail because uh, he's been arrested, you know. All the press would have sit behind him and his family. Um, it's a big courtroom. Took me out into the witness stand, show, you know, asked me what I wanted to uh, swear on, the Bible or whatever, um, you know, the whole thing. Uh, so that was, and that was really good to have been taken through because the next time I got in there um, was when it was my turn, right? And, again, I get smuggled in by with my girlfriend and my cop, Tony, um, Sergeant Tony, um, and I'm sent, and, and we get smuggled in through this kind of large kind of cupboard, which has got a whole lot of crap in it. So 
because again, they don't want the press to see me, and I don't want them to see me either. You know, and uh, and he says to me, right, Susie, I don't want you. I don't want you to look at him at all. I just want you to look at the judge, the jury, and you know, both both lawyers. I don't want you to look at him at all. And I'm like, oh, Tony, can I just give him the finger as I walk past? He's going, Susie, no. <laughs> But I did exactly what I was told because when I walked through that door, it was packed. It was wall-to-wall people and it was dead quiet when I walked in. Um, and uh, so I walked up and I took my, you know, I hopped on the stand, did the swearing and everything, swearing in, um, and um, I didn't look at him at all and I just did exactly what I was supposed to do. His lawyer tried to trick me up with dumb questions about the industry, which, you know, was beyond research. But anyway, um, and... Uh, and then I talked to the, I had to talk to the jury about well I didn't I didn't have to but I talked to the jury about my knickers what knickers what undies I was wearing because on set he kept um, shoving his hand up my shorts I had these baggy shorts on uh, which had a little rip in the thigh before they became you know really ripped now we had we had much more modest rips back in the eighties ladies and gentlemen um, and he'd keep trying to shove his head he'd always every time I went to touch him up uh, and put powder on his face right which was a fair fair amount of time because it's hot in the studios back then. He'd shove his, he'd shove his hand up my shorts. Um, and so I'd talk about my knickers because back then it was the beginning of the, um, I'm sure you all want to hear about knickers, you know, this is an entertainment program, isn't it? Back then, a little bit of a knicker, a bit a little bit of knicker education before the G-string slash thong was invented, uh, they made these knickers that was like a triangle at the back and a bigger triangle, a, a triangle at the front and a bigger triangle at the back and a string. It just went like elastic kind of string that went all the way around the sides. So you're still wearing knickers and then, you know, as the decades went on, the back bit just got smaller and smaller and smaller, you know. Um, But I talked about the knickers because I felt that um, he couldn't feel my undies so he kept trying to shove because there's just, you know, elastic around the top of my hips, you know, so he kept trying to shove his hand in there and he'd try and shove his hand in the rip in my thigh as well and I'd have to grab his hand and go, no, don't do that. You'll you'll, You'll rip my pants. And back in the 80s we used to wear these big belts that would you just hang big thick belts and they just hang down the front and he would grab my belt and pull me towards him and try and crotch grind me. I mean it was full on. Yeah, you know, it was quite ridiculous. But anyway. Uh, so I'm talking to them about my knickers, right? So I've got the jury laughing. Um and um at the end, which is her job, his lawyer, barrister, uh, pretty much, um, not pretty much, she called me a liar. Um, and it's actually, I'm a really honest person. Like I'm gobsmackingly honest. I'm one of those friends, if you want to know the truth, ask me. And if you don't, don't ask, you know. Um, and, um, I just been really honest and, and, you know, talked about my knickers and stuff. And, um, it was, um, it was like being hit in the stomach, being called a liar. Um, and I, um, uh, I had a physical reaction. I snorted with derision. I didn't say anything. I snorted with derision. I, I couldn't even snort now to save my life, right? But I knew exactly what, it, what my body had done and the reaction that I'd had while I was there. And I'm like, oh, and I, I didn't say anything, um, but I started getting angry and I started getting upset because it was it's a pretty big deal. I kept myself in my happy state and now I was at the end, right? Um, and I got off my the witness box and I glared at him. In his, I didn't look at anybody else but him. I was done. I looked at him and I stared at him all the way down the aisle to the end and he he did not look at me once. He turned his entire chair around um, so his back was facing me as I stalked out of the courtroom. Um, The press was sitting behind him going, oh, my God, this is awesome, riding away. I was like, oh, my God, look, it's guilty, it's guilty. Um, I I, I paced past him. My girlfriend was sitting on the left-hand side and I had my handbag there. And I, let, I, did, I kind of kept walking, grabbed her bag and said, let's grab my bag and said, let's go. So she was just behind me. Now this courtroom had these really, remember, I hadn't come in through these doors, right? I'd been snuck in. They were big, thick doors. So there's me thinking, solid, right? I've got a pace on. I slammed into the door with my hand to push it, thinking it was heavy. Not heavy, right? It, it slams against the door and there's two of them. Bang, bang, our courtroom jumps twice. <laughs> Susie Dent leaves the room. <laughs> By the time I got out of there, though, I was so upset. I, the tears started to come. I was F this and F that and I'm not an effing liar and it was the emotions were just boiling up. One of the cops came running out after me to make sure I didn't go in the wrong direction where people could see me, took me to this room um, where there's lots of lots of police. Um, uh, somebody made me a cup of tea while I breathed um, and... Um, 
calm myself down and, you know, I'm sitting in the cop room going, fucking not a liar, fuck, wah, wah. Um, and uh, everybody's really calm. It was great. And then the guy who actually the police, the police, I don't know whether he's commander, the man who headed the whole of Operation New Tree came into the room and stood in front of me and took my hand and he said to me, Susie, you did an excellent job. He said, we are so proud of you. And I'm like, oh, it was like this huge weight was lifted off me. I thought, oh, thank goodness. I did okay for everyone, you know, because I wasn't there for me. I was there for the women who were little girls when he abused them because that's so wrong, you know. When we were there at lunchtime, um, the court clerk said one of the ladies that um, who was 49 who was sexually assaulted by him, they had to rig a blanket up between her and him so she couldn't see him because she was that distraught. And, and that's 49 and that's just, that's no good. That's, you know, that's just not good enough. Uh, so um, they uh, got smuggled out right? um, and back to the hotel room. And um, that night, um, um, the headline, the headlines are all about me. Now, the, the, so with such imagination, the courts called me SD. Mm, okay, not easy to find. Yeah, let's use my real initials. Good for you. Upstairs for thinking, kids. That's great. So um, they, uh, the, my favourite headline that night was... Um, Australian television makeup artist dramatically stares down Rolf Harris in court. And I'm like, I did that. That was me. That was me. And my mates back in Australia, because I couldn't really tell anybody I was going, because, you know, it's a secrecy kind of thing. Um, uh, they're all just cheering me on, going, that's, that's our Suze. Go for it. Go for it. Um, the weird thing was, is the SD, the very next day, the BBC found me and contacted me. So it didn't take them long to figure out who I was. Um, I think pretty much because he's actually on my CV and they just Googled my CV <laughs> and figured it out. Um, and um, for the next week and a half, um, this producer regularly contacted me via email to try and offer me, uh, to try and convince me to talk to her and give them my story. Right um, Now the thing is, is I decided I'd play this game because I've worked in film and TV for, and advertising for a long time, right, so I know how it works. Um, normal people who don't, they don't get it. They don't get the manipulation and stuff. And I was actually um, quite fascinated to see where she'd go. Really? I thought, okay, I'll play the game. Uh, I already told her from the very beginning that I had no intention of talking to anybody because it wasn't about me. It was about the other women uh, and to talk to them. But nobody was waving their anonymity. But to get someone, one of us, to talk in this huge, massive court case is such major advertising revenue for a television station. And that's, and, and you know, I'm just letting you guys know this is how it works. It's all about the money, all about the money. Uh, and so this woman, you know, she'd keep offering, she offered, uh, she said, we'll have a cup of coffee. And I thought, oh, I don't actually drink coffee, but okay, no. Uh, at one stage, um, about a week and a half in, um, this, and this was daily, she'd send me stuff, and I'd, you know, I'd eventually reply back to her. And then she come, came up with, um, oh, we'll put you on um, a TV show and we'll, and we'll you know, we'll um, darken out your face. So no one can see you, and uh, we'll um, um, oh we can and, and the next thing after that was um, oh we'll get someone else to talk for you, and I thought and I, in my head I'm thinking oh mate um, they already know it's an Australian television makeup artist I think you've missed the boat there I mean you know, that's a, but I was fascinated to see how far she'd go you know, and then um, I was uh, we were having a little day trip there was probably about a week and a half after the court case after my bid right and it's all still going at this time right. And she actually called me to tell me that my name had been released in court that day. Right? Um, I completely freaked out, not at her, right? I was just like, got off the phone and thought, oh my God. Um, and the reason why is um, I had a 12 year old son at the time. Before I left, I um, uh, the federal police here were involved in the case and they came and interviewed me. So the police here knew it was a big. Big, big operation, you know. There was British police that came out here, the whole kit and caboodle. Um, and my, um, I had contacted them before I went and made sure my husband um, had their phone number. Uh, so if uh, anything like this happened, that um, my kid wouldn't wake up to go to, and my husband wouldn't wake up the next day to go to school and have press camped all over my street, you know, and all over our driveway. So that was my first worry. Uh, I've got to protect my family. You know, I was in England. They couldn't find me, but they could certainly find my family. Um, and, uh, so yeah, put panic into me. And the worst thing was my cop, um, my fabulous liaise was on holidays for five days. So I couldn't, I couldn't contact him. I see it was off email and it was a weekend as well. So I was like, oh, 
Uh, so my husband back here, you know, he was annoyed that she'd done that, but he talked me down and go, no, she's just lying. And it turns out, of course, that she was. And I didn't do anything about it. But every as soon as I, I could, I was on the internet and I was looking for at, at all the press to see where my name is going to be leaked, uh, you know, and to try because the only way you can follow what someone's going to do is if you read it. So I, I became kind of a little bit obsessed over this period, uh, trying to make sure that, well, not making sure, but just looking for stuff about me. And even though they didn't write my name and they weren't allowed to write physical descriptions, all the words that I used, everything I said um, was in the press. Uh, so, again, really it's weird. It's a weird thing to go through. Um, it was amazing, though, because we won, as we should have, and he was sentenced to jail um, and was given five years and nine months, which I know is not long. The man's, I don't know, 88 now, so that in perspective. But they uh, they they give them the... It's kind of based on the historical level, you know, not the now level of things when they sentence people. Um, but either way, he had a, lots of, everybody knows who he is now. Um, and uh, it's changed the world. And, and back then, this is, this, is, this is the beginning of the Me Too movement, you know, um, where uh, women started coming forward in support of each other um, and telling their stories of historical crimes. Uh, another case happened in, in Australia at the time with a soap opera where one of the actors was abusing the, the, the female actor's child on set. He was sentenced to 10 years jail. And, again, you know, they, some, sometimes in, in the entertainment industry people are protected in ways that they shouldn't be uh, because it's all about money. Like I said, the, the producer wanted me because of the advertising revenue they would get uh, and, and the scoop of having me and being the ones that get me again major bucks and whatever newspapers they're connected with, you know, it's all about money, not really about the story. It's about getting the story and what you make out of it, you know. Uh, so the world was devastated um, when uh, he was found guilty and still for a long time many people didn't believe it um, and the uh, women that came forward, we were all really much, pretty much accused of, you know, we're doing it for the money and, uh, and um, you know, we're just, you know, we're all lying because there's no way he could possibly do that. Um, some um, other, so some celebrities uh, in the UK actually who weren't part of the court case um, but wanted to be uh, came forward with their stories and they were completely crucified by that, like that time in the press. One woman was, um, uh, had a, I think she had a breakfast show over there and she was a larger lady and she was just trolled unrelentlessly and I thought it's just people are awful, you know. Uh, so um, I stayed anonymous because it wasn't the right time for me to come forward. Um, it wasn't the right time in the world. I knew what would happen to me. Um, they had photos of me uh, of when I was um, 23, which is how old I was, uh, when I had my day with him, what I looked like back then. Um, we already know that the email to the judge got leaked, so those photos would have been out there, photos of me then, photos of me now, and we see it all the time. Oh, would I have sex with her then or would I have sex with her now? You know, is she doable, you know? And that, that's, that's what it comes up to. Uh, and I said to the cops, I said, I don't want to be uh, the poster girl for groping. Thank you very much. I'm not interested in putting myself through that. And at the time um, I was um, not in a great place in my marriage. I was in a toxic codependency uh, with a very angry uh, husband and um, I just didn't need to bring any more stress into our lives. And I wasn't... Um, I wasn't in any way healed enough to and be uh, and or strong enough to actually withstand that sort of attack, you know. Um, and uh, so came back home and um, life went on, not in a great way with the with the ex. Um, had a lot of crap going on, and I was going through this period. He eight years he was not very good, and he was very angry. So for eight years, I didn't really feel like I was enough. Um, lost a lot of my self-esteem. Um, uh, for him, he never left the house, you know, so uh, he wouldn't leave. He was, you know, very troubled. And the thing is, is when, when you're angry at yourself, um, you're always going to strike out at those nearest and dearest to you um, and the ones you love, you know, and there's always situations in life that can drive us down a path that we're not necessarily very proud of, you know. Um, but uh, it took its toll on me and um, I, uh, I remember... Um, I'd wake up um, 
in the morning and just start crying because I was just so unhappy and I'd hear he'd been up all night and he was pacing around and you could just feel the anger and I'd just lay here really quietly. We don't sleep together, just so you know. We've been together for 30 years. We're now divorced. But we still live together because we're just selling the house. So we've come out the other sides and we're friends now and everything's good, you know. Um, and we'll always be friends. Um, you know, you don't, you're not with someone for 30 years for nothing. You know? um, but we did have a crap period of time. Uh, so... I, uh, I started listening to motivational speakers because I realised that we're the only ones that can inspire ourselves and get ourselves out of our own little black hole, you know. Uh, and I was always going on daily walks and stuff, so I started listening and I learnt that to make change in our lives, uh, we have to make ourselves uncomfortable. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, so I thought about what I wanted to do. What do I want to do, you know? And I'd kind of, um, I'd, I'd kind of pray, but not really. I'd put out wishes to the universe, you know. And I thought, I know. What if I just do some um, in front of the camera work instead of behind the camera work for a change, you know, like in commercials and stuff, uh, you know, because that'd be easy and I look all right, you know, um, get mum, you know, older mum roles or something like that. It's good money. And I used to sing in bands and I'm really good on a microphone and I can act and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, and it won't rock my husband's world too much because I'm still going to a studio. I'm still in the same industry. I'm just, you know, doing a bit, you know, that's, so that's what the wish, I put that out, right, to the universe. This is what I'd like to do. Be careful what you wish for. Right? So God, source love, the universe, life, whatever we're going to call this wonderful energy that we have around us, has a plan for us. We, there's a plan. Sometimes we fall off the path that we're supposed to be on and sometimes we make the right decision and we're right back on the path that we're supposed to be on. And I believe we're kind of sent, we're sent whispers, uh, whispers from God, source love, um, and uh, if we listen to the whispers and take action, we can change our lives. And if we don't, well, then we don't. We keep staying on the same path. So two weeks after I put my wish out, I am um, sent this um, message from this woman who is the uh, director of the Mrs Earth Australia Beauty Pageant, and she says to me, um, we think you'd be a really good fit as a contestant in our pageant. And I'm like, fell off the, fell off the bed laughing, right? And I just thought, oh, my God, that is well, that must be a really good photo I've got up there. Sweet. That is so good. And I got back to her and I said, thank you so much. You just made my month, you know, but I'm 55 because I was 55 at the time and I don't wear dresses, you know. And she's like, no, no, there are older women that do it. She ignored the dress part. There are older women that do it. And I thought all of a sudden I realised I'm in a sliding doors moment. I've been sent a really weird opportunity right now. And I checked this pageant out and they supported this charity called Souls for Souls who collect new and used shoes for people to donate to, to give to people overseas and in countries that, where people don't have shoes, right? And I'm also a wardrobe stylist, so I'm working with secondhand clothes all the time. I've got like a, I had a single garage full of clothes that I'd use for shoots, you know. So for me, secondhand shoes was just like, wow, this is really synergistic, you know. And I just thought, and I did and I thought, I'm, I'm going to say yes. I could say no and get back in bed and cry or I could say yes to this really out there experience that's just landed in my lap. So I said yes and, oh, wow, that was the absolute right thing to say. Things, the the life path that I was telling you, it was like a railway line, you know, and they change and go and you've changed lines. All of a sudden with that yes, my line changed and I was on the path that I was supposed to be on, you know. Now I never wore dresses because... um Back in the 80s, quick quick segue back, um, I used to get touched up by every boss that I ever had. I worked in the bank when I was 19. Um, I wasn't allowed to wear the trousers that the other girls were, uh, 18, sorry, uh, were allowed to wear. Uh, the accountant liked me to wear the little short skirt. I was sent home when I wore the pants to work once to put on the little short skirt. Um, so he liked to look at me while I made him his coffee. Um, I got sexually assaulted in the safe by the bank man- assist- assistant bank manager who locked, locked me in the safe so he could fill me up. I worked in a restaurant at the same time um, and um, the uniform had, this is the 80s, everybody, the uniform had like slits up to um, just above the knee and, the, and the, the manager there, he used to take me into his office at the beginning of the shift and rip my dress to the waist, both sides, right, and I'd, and I'd just stand there, get the stapler off his desk and go, and I'd staple my dress back together and go, you finished? And he'd go, yeah, and then I'd go to work. And I'd work all, all night in my stapled uniform and the next day he would do it again. He did it for quite a while 
And he'd say, have you sewn it yet? And I'm going, no, what's the point? Why would I do that? So I just staple it. Um, one day I acquired um, this rubber cockroach. Now, in Australia we have these German cockroaches. They're big. They're like an inch long. I think that's like five centimetres. They're big things, right? They fly. <laughs> This one looked really real. Now, both these men like me to make coffee for them, right? Um, so the, the the accountant in the bank got it first. The screams from this man of horror when he got to the bottom of his cup of coffee and found the cockroach. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't uh, tweak that I'd actually put it in there, right? So I, took, I got the coffee cup back that week. I got the manager at the, the restaurant manager as well, and I did his coffee, and he absolutely lost his nana. He stopped dripping my dress from that night and never asked me to make him a coffee again. Um, the accountant, um, I, I, uh, I ordered new bank uniforms and I ordered two sizes too big and I didn't hem them. So they were down to my shins and two sizes too big. And I thought there's nothing in the bylaws that says I have to, I have to wear tight and short. So I looked like I wore a sack. Um, and I was quite com- very comfortable like that. But that, that period of time when I was around 19, 20, I started covering my body up um, uh, and dressing down. Back then you, you couldn't walk past a building site. From the age of 14, you know, you walk past a building site and men would just hang off and whistle and catcall and say things and sexual stuff. And when you're older, and especially like if you're in the 30s, you're like, yes, I've still got it. But when you're 14, it's really scary, you know. Um Mechanics back then, mechanics would have female pornography over the walls of in their garages. So when we, all of them had it. So as a woman, you'd go in and there's full frontal, full, full leg spread nudity greeting you and an attitude towards women often that went with it. Um, things have changed a lot now because my generation has paved the way, you know. Um, but that's kind of, that's a little snapshot. Of, of the 80s and it didn't just happen to me this sort of stuff happened to women all over the all over the place and it, and it happened to my mother and, and probably worse and her mother you know it's it's got less and less each generation you know uh so um I'm, I'm now known because I'm going to court um as one of the women at the beginning of the me too movement that I'm very proud of um and it's um uh really very cool um and the reason one of the reasons, part of my journey. So I've, I've gone back there. Now I'm going to come back to the to the beauty queen thing. So I, I um I had I had a pull on elastic skirt and a pair of boots. Right, I didn't have any high heel shoes. I had this business that I used to deal with called Barter Card. So I got they got they sent me this little tiara when I was a finalist and a finalist sash. I got to say I felt pretty dumb wearing the tiara, but I thought no, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to go for it. So I wore a t-shirt, right, that was at a skirt. Went to this guy and I said, right, so. Um, your business, um, you guys sponsor men who drive fast, hit fast and run fast. What about a middle-aged beauty queen collecting shoes for charity? And he loved my balls in it so much that he said yes. Uh, and they they sponsored me. They gave me PR. I ended up having a national um, campaign across the country where Bartercard opened their offices all in every state across the country so that people could drop their shoes there so we could collect them. Um, I had press in newspapers and in television. It was it was amazing. Um, and on my journey, um, I got taught, uh, I had speaking opportunities come to me. So I had to learn um, and get over my fear of wearing dresses. Um, and I started doing that. Um, I had a dress made for me, my very first gown to go to the finals and compete as Mrs Earth Australia. Um, when uh, the lovely lady, she designed, she made something that I liked and it was kind of sheer across here, right? And I put it and I looked down and I could see my cleavage and I burst into tears because I was so freaked out because before that I don't, I never wore things that were sleeveless. I would never, ever show my cleavage in public like ever except, you know, at the pool. Um, and um, I felt so uncomfortable. And she's going, just look, don't look down. I'm going, I can't help it. I can't help it. She's going, look straight ahead. I go, ah! And she was so beautiful. Um, but I had, I, I needed, I, I had a psychological fear by then of wearing dresses. I couldn't actually put on anything that made me feel it made me feel rude and exposed and I was brought up in a very religious, strict religious family with a strict religious dress code um, and um, I just so I had all this very strong moral stuff as far as dressing. There's a lot of crap going on in here as far as me wearing a dress, you know. So it was actually a really big deal 
for me to, to put on a, a gown, you know. However, suck it up, princess, is one of my sayings, um, and I sucked it up and she put a beautiful applique, bang, smack there, a really big one, right in the middle of my cleavage, so I couldn't see it at all, so it was great. Um, and uh, I went down there. I had an amazing weekend, and um, before I'd gone, I, I, um, I researched the pageant industry for my journey. And in America, if you want to learn about pageantry, you can find out everything you want there. So I, I, I threw myself into the world of pageantry. I mean, I'm a, I was a tomboy. I wasn't a girly girl. You know, I didn't have any high heel shoes. I had to learn everything, you know, including how to walk in heels. Um, uh, and um, I, uh, it was, it's a fascinating industry. It's not what people think. It's all about self-confidence and self-esteem building and charities and what you can give back to the world. Um, and um, I've ever so much enjoyed my journey. And so I, I, um, I also had to learn how to wear high heels. And the first ones were only this big, right, and I'd stand at the end of my bed and kind of hobble along, you know, on the carpet, and that was okay, you know. And then you, then you, then you make sure you score on the bottom of your shoes so you don't slip over on the slidey tiles, you know. Um, but what I did do every day is I visualised myself winning. I tapped into my self-belief and my, I'd already tapped into my faith. I believed 100% uh, that um, uh, and, and had faith that this was the journey I was supposed to be on. I had so many sponsors come to me, Sarah. I had cosmetic companies. I had clothing companies giving me stuff. I had a personal trainer. Um, I had all these people wanting, believing in me and wanting to support me, so I, I could not not believe in myself. So every day I would visualise that I'd won and I'd be standing on the stage and there'd be the crowd there and I'd hear my voice, hear, hear this, the words, and Mrs Earth Australia 2017, Susie Dead, yeah, and the crowd goes wild and I'd fill myself up with the joy and the excitement and the gratitude of winning, you know, and I did that every day and I put myself in that position and, and felt that every day and I went down there and um, um was because of competing, I was the oldest competitor. Uh, and there's another lady who was 55 as well, and she was really lovely. And I remember the first day she said to me, Oh, you know, I just, she hadn't won anything, right? She'd been doing this all uh, years. She said, I just love coming and being with the other girls. And I said, Oh, that's awesome. I said, I'm here to win. <laughs> because you know what? Life, it tells us wherever we read, set your intentions, state your intentions. It's not, Oh, I might do it. It's like, I'm doing it. It's done. I've done it, you know? Uh, so uh, by this stage, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd conquered some of my fear of frocks, you know, so my self-esteem had risen. Um, my self-confidence has always been really high and there's a difference between self-confidence and self-esteem. You can fake having self-confidence but you can't fake not having, I mean, having self-esteem, you know, you can't fake that. Uh, so, uh, so I'm there. I had a great time. There was an interview section. Uh, there was a... a, a um, a gown section and um, uh, you had to make your own outfit. So I'd made this outfit. So anyway, comes down to it and we've got, we've got, they're, they're calling, you know, there's like six, let's start with number six and number five, number four. And I'm thinking, oh, might be with a shot here. Um, anyway, I get to number two, number one. And I hear those words, those words I'd visualize, visualize in my head every night. And there I was um, being crowned Mrs. Earth Australia First one, 2017. It was amazing. Um, I won a pair of shoes that night that were six-inch heels that I had to learn to walk in. Uh, three months later, I find myself in Vegas, having practised wearing dresses, done lots of speaking engagements, um, raised so many shoes and, and um, done an amazing thing with the charity, met so many people, had so many doors open for me because I'd said yes, you know. Uh, so I go over there and I believed again that I was going to win. I was competing against 36 women from around the world. Uh, some of them, um, I well, basically, I've just over half of them I could have given birth to, which was great uh, because, you know, it was misses. So there was women there in their early 20s. When I was there, I was given the opportunity to jump up into the over 40s and I looked at the over 40s and I thought, no, that's too easy. That's too easy. Um, and I wanted to stay with a level playing field because I wanted to have the full adventure of it all, you know. And again, um, oh, they had this swimsuit section because this is, you know, the internationals. There's no way I was going to wear a swimsuit, not because I don't have the body for it, but come on, I don't just, you know, I don't just flash my cleavage. Uh, you know, I don't just got frocks on. I was not going to go like nude, semi nude on, on a stage in front of the world. Uh, so, um, but you could wear swimwear or you could wear sportswear. So, me and my husband um, designed um, this Bond girl inspired scuba suit. So it had short sleeves, right? It had a little boy leg, 
Um, it had a zipper up the front. It was really cute. I had it made out of um, uh, recycled materials because Mrs Earth is an environmental pageant from a, from a woman that was making things for him for free because I'd won her, uh, which was great. Uh, and um, I strapped a dive knife to my bicep a dive knife to my thigh and one on my on my waist. I had those six-inch heels on. I strutted out on the stage and I went, put my arms up in two big, uh, you know, uh, fist pumps uh, to the side and went, rah! And they absolutely loved it. And I scored three straight tens and a 9.5 in the swimwear section, changed the pageant industry so that they don't have to um, wear swimwear anymore, rocked it up. Um, so it was amazing. Um, I got to experience that thing on stage that we see, you know, like the Sandra Bullock moment where you're standing there and, and they've got the headphones on you so you can't hear the question and you're there with the others but you can't hear anything. All you can hear is music. I got to experience that. I got to go on a stage and um, be asked the question in front of everybody. And then I got to be one of those women and I became third in the world and was crowned Mrs Earth Health. Um, I was absolutely thrilled with that, stoked with not winning um, because I wasn't ready to be, to cruise around the world and do all that queen thing. The woman who won was my mate, which was awesome. She was from the UK and she absolutely was perfect for it. The beautiful thing was if I had gone, the funny thing was I should say, if I'd gone in the over 40s, I would have won by five points. However, I was so pleased with third because it encompassed everything that I was about, you know, at 55, you know, mental, emotional, physical and spiritual health. Um, I had a PR agent uh, that that afternoon. I'm, I'm on a live radio cross, uh, a live interview to Australia. Um, I come home. Uh, two hours later, I'm on breakfast television, morning television. Um, I had press all around the world as the tomboy to beauty queen, 55-year-old. Doors have opened up to me all over the place, which is absolutely amazing, and I've inspired other older women with my, you know, age is just a number. Um kind of catchphrase because you can do whatever you want if you have I figured out the four steps you got to have one you've got to step into gratitude you've got to be grateful for everything that you have number two you've got to step into faith and believe that you're on the right path and that God has a plan for you and you are absolutely on it number three you've got to step into self-belief and absolutely believe 100% that you're going to do it if other people believed I was going to do it then I had to believe it you know and number four it's probably the most important thing is you've got to step into action. You've got to take action. So like when people say, oh, yeah, I'm going to win the lottery, and you're like, do you buy lottery tickets? No. Well, stepping into action would be to buy the ticket really, you know. Uh, and so, you know, I approached everybody. I got all this stuff. It was all happening. Uh, so it was the most amazing journey. Um, and looking back now, I know that um, God sent me on that journey to learn how to dress properly, to raise my self-esteem to high levels, um, to be, um, I'm, I've, I've won international awards as a speaker now. Um, I've been speaking um, about the Me Too movement and about my journey, um, about um, what I've just told you about and about my story uh, to, you know, to empower yourself. You've got to make yourself uncomfortable and sometimes it comes in the weirdest, weirdest ways, you know, and it seems really weird, the messages that we get sent, but, you know, stick your toe in. You never, ever know. You, if When you say yes to those experiences, all sorts of things can happen, you know. 2019, after my two-year kind of journey, um, I was healed enough and strong enough and in the position enough to waive my anonymity. And I wanted to try and change the defamation laws in my country because the Me Too movement in the US, in the UK and in New Zealand was going ahead in leaps and bounds with laws being changed and and and, and men being, uh, you know, uh, called to answer for their behaviours and uh, people being sacked and laws being changed. But in Australia, love my country, but we have a very antiquated, very chauvinistic system where um, uh, those laws are in, in kind of in support of the perpetrator rather than the victim. So I wanted to draw, to kind of bring awareness to that and to that, hey, everybody, don't, don't be despondent in Australia. We, we were there at the beginning. I just want to remind everybody, you know, this is what we did, you know, this is what's happening as far as talking about the case. Uh, so that then put my name and my face on who I was, um, which led to more interviews about my story and um, press in the UK and all that sort of stuff. But now I could talk about um, healing and why people come forward and why witnesses come forward. It's not for money. Nobody got offered any money. Um, it's because um, it's about our healing journeys 
because when we share our stories, you know, and, and often it's you have to be very brave to share some of these stories. You know, these things happen to us when we're younger and it sets us up to have negative self-belief systems when we're older uh, or to be on a really uh, the not right life path, you know, where we're not reaching our full potential. And when we dig deep and we, um, we, uh, we bring out our stories, the only way we heal is through talking. And when we talk about our stories, um, it helps us heal. We bring it out each time. And when others read our stories or hear our stories, when you when you read something and it's very similar to yours, you're like, wow, I remember I watched this video with Ellen uh, and Ellen was telling this story. I can't even remember where it was, but um, she was like 14 and she was telling this story of when she got sexually assaulted and it was exactly the same thing that happened to me. And I'm just sitting there going, wow, I feel such a solidarity with you right now. I feel like I have this connection with you and I realise the strength in telling stories and sharing our stories and how much of an effect it can have on those who hear them and read them. And um, my journey um, has taken me um, all over the place of a beautiful podcast like this and um, being interviewed and, uh, and sharing my story and talking to other women. I've, um, I've almost, uh, I have written a book called Bare Naked and Beautiful, which is um, in honour of um, uh, women who, uh, well, the women in my book have, have actually been interviewed uh, and they're telling us their stories of sexual assault and sharing their healing journeys with us. And it's a really amazing book um, uh, that celebrates the amazing journeys um, these women have been on. Um, and, very, and some of these stories will be quite triggering for some. And some women told me their stories for the very first time and their healing journeys have begun. And um, I'm recording an audio book and it will be released soon and I'm very excited to be able to share these women's stories with everybody and keep the healing journey going. Um, I, um, I got to be part of a, uh, it hasn't been released yet, a big documentary that I was filmed by uh, a UK company last year actually and um, it's all about Operation Nutri and four of the men including Rolf Harris and I was interviewed for two hours and uh, um, I've been hoping, wishing and praying for 10 minutes of airtime. So uh, my story is about, you know, healing and forgiveness and um, apart from, you know, what happened in the court but why we come forward and, and the police who are part of Operation New Tree have been uh, connected with me this whole time, which has been great. Uh, so I've always been able to reach out for them to them for, with any questions about anything at, at all, if I had so desired. And uh, they were very hard. so they were very happy that I was chosen, uh, or that I can't, that you know that I was chosen to do this because I represent all the witnesses um, and the survivors. Uh, as the pro- as the producer said to me, she said, "Susie, some of these women aren't healed enough to speak yet," and I totally understand that. So I got to speak on their behalf. And when I was over there in England and that, you know, some of those headlines happened, I was so excited um, because I really hoped that those words would give those women, like the one who stood behind the blanket, strength, that she had power and, and that there were other women there supporting her because uh, we're a big tribe, you know. People, people, the press tell us that women, that we, that we stab each other in the back and we don't support each other and we're always competing with each other. But I beg to differ because in 2017 when then hashtag Me Too went out around the world and millions and millions of women, women stood up in solidarity with each other, that just proves what a tribe we are. And uh, that has helped so many more women come forward in support of themselves and with others and change is happening and it takes a little while and it's going to take a while because the change that is happening is um, educating on generational mindset the mindset and the thought patterns that, you know, that kind of around the Me Too movement, around the Me Too situation come from granddad and grandma where women were supposed to be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen, couldn't vote or drive, you know. It takes a while. I have friends who are in their 60s who will be very respect males, very respectful to my face, but some of the stuff they say about women they will still say because they are in the habit of saying it. And it's up to us to gently educate rather than, you know, stab them with a knife and go, you can't say that. It's about educating people on the importance of understanding um, the um, the generational mindset and how strong it is in people with these sort of things. So there you go, Sarah. That's a little bit about me. (laughs) Ha-ha. Well, I've absolutely loved hearing your story and, you know, just kind of how everything happened, you know, as you said, you know, you were you were put uh, to certain things, and it just kind of happened as it was. You know, when you first came forward, it was 
you know, for the other women. And then it turns around, you ended up, you know, becoming a beauty queen and were able to experience then kind of that gratitude for yourself. So I appreciate you sharing everything. I do want to ask you one question as I do with all of my guests at the end, I ask something different. Um, so not related to the story that you share, but something else about you. So that question is, what is one thing that is on your bucket list? One thing that is on my bucket list is I really want to go to Iceland um, uh, where they have those big ice igloos, right, and they're made like houses, um, but they're all made out of ice and you can go and stay there and then you can look through the ice ceiling and see aurora borealis in the sky. It has to come with a chef um, and it has to come with um, a, a sleigh, a sled a sled thing with huskies and a very cute man that's actually driving it, you know. So I have to have a sled driver, a chef, um, and I'd quite, because now I'm divorced, I, I'm in my um, bucket list, wish list is a very cute partner because, you know, there'd be a log fire there and, you know, it'd be a very romantic thing to do. That's on my bucket list. And I'd really like to, something really easy, I'd really like to um, experience a white Christmas in America with all the big table and everybody around and the talking and the food and the turkey and the snow outside and snow angels and the fireplace and eat all the food that you've got that has names that I don't know that I've never tried. I'd really like to do that. All right, that brings this episode to a close. I'll be leaving links for Susie in the description, so directly to her website, along with her Facebook page that you can go and follow. And of course, as always, the podcast website is in the description as well. That brings you to all of our social media, all past episode, all past resources, and everything good like that. And if you'd like to connect with me, my email address is in the description, and there's also a link if you would like to support the podcast monetarily. So I always appreciate your support and sharing out the episodes and continuing to hear great stories like Susie's. So thank you so much, Susie, for spending your time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Bye everyone. Have a beautiful day.